Mimini Thomas, huh? I'm Thomas Post, um, and this is my friend Peter Moody. Uh, I have two roles. I'm a member of the Amaranth Institute, which I encourage you all to join. I think Walt will explain a little bit more about that tomorrow. And I am also, uh, I work with World Renew. And I am very interested in Amaranth for about 20 years already. Um, but before we get into our presentation, I would like to give you a, a little bit of a taste of an evaluation that we did four years ago. Um, Peter, would you like to introduce yourself just briefly? Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Moody. I work for Anglican Development Services in Western Kenya. That's around the border of Mount Elgon, then the Lake Victoria, then bordering Uganda. That's the Western Kenya. Thank you. Okay, Erwin, could you show the previous slide again? All right, so what I think is interesting uh, in our presentation is that we have been experiencing this amaranth now for about 20 years. Uh, me, myself, I started in 1999 with amaranth, okay? So when we did an evaluation four years ago, which included a lot of emphasis on Peter's area in Western Kenya, we were looking at questions like, is this really sustainable? When you start it, will people continue? And if they continue, why? And if they stop, if they stop growing and eating amaranth, why? Okay, so next one, please, Peter. Um, at the beginning of the evaluation, we had the help from this gentleman here, Roland Bunch, who is kind of famous in development world, especially with Echo. He's presented several times. And Roland is very, very interested in the nutritional and hunger situation in Africa because the soil fertility is so low in some places. So Roland went with us in the first part of the evaluation. Next slide, please. And um, this was in a village where Davidson Mwangi had started with me in 1999. Uh, and Dr. Davidson Wangi, he was the man that gave us the first seeds which he had selected. So number one in this kind of success story is you have to have seeds in order to grow this grain amaranth. And he had selected the seed. Number two was very interesting that when we started, the first lesson was how do you eat this grain? Okay? So we ate it in three ways, popped and uji and ugali. Okay? And then the thing that I think uh, Davidson Mwangi made a mistake is that he promised that he would buy their amaranth. He promised a market. And that was a mistake because he couldn't complete the promise. So one of the lessons I would say is don't promise what you cannot do. Huh? Okay. Although he could do it at the beginning, but not later. All right, next one, please. Oh, here's the lesson, though. In this place called Ngamba, which is uh, about an hour from Machakos in Kenya, it's a semi-arid area, um, without any support for more than 10 years, 18 out of 21 farmers were still growing amaranth, usually intercrop with maize. One amaranth here, one there, like spaced out, huh? Not, not one solid block of amaranth but spaced in the maze. Next one, please. And you may ask yourself, well, now you've already heard. There's a lot of enthusiasm about amaranth. Huh? Uh, one of the things that made us enthusiastic was near to a place called Maasai Rural Training Center in Kenya. Uh, there was a malnutrition child named Enoch, and he recovered very rapidly over about three or four months. He recovered a lot of his lost weight by eating the amaranth. So that encouraged us, huh? even though you didn't have the scientific reasons why, it was encouraging to see the result. Next one, please. Um, in, in the challenge, the way I felt it when I was living in Kenya, we have these challenge. We have the fairly high elevation above sea level, um, but at the equator you have this for me, from the United States, it's still a strange rainfall regime. You have two rainy season and two dry season. 
And both of the rainy seasons are quite short. And yet people are trying to grow maize while the fastest maize is 90 days, three months. Maize needs to mature. That's the fastest one that I know about. So many times the maize crop fails or is very poor because the rainy season is too short. And that leads to people seeking food relief from organizations like World Vision, World Renew, and others, huh? So, and then the other thing is that people remember when the government used to have marketing board for cotton, in the semi-arid areas especially. So they're longing for a cash crop. And then lastly, especially in the early 2000s, Kenya had a lot of, a lot of AIDS, very high frequency of AIDS. So a lot of people were dying and that was made worse by poor nutrition. So that's a little bit of the context that we saw. And then we see the amaranth with potential, that it's drought resistant, it matures, the ones that Mwangi gave us, mature in about 75 days at the equator. So it kind of beats the dry season in two ways, that it's drought resistant and also it's fast maturing. So from an agricultural perspective, I'm an agronomist, that was very intriguing to me. And now with climate change, it turns out that it's very heat tolerant. So it can go hotter, uh, even though maize may start to, to, uh, to regress a little bit, the amaranth can tolerate more heat even and more drought than maize or sorghum. So, okay. But we who are involved with ECHO, we get all excited, like you can tell it by voice, probably. I still get excited about this amaranth that my wife doesn't understand why, but that's okay. But uh, it turns out we can be excited about our favorite ideas, but not give enough follow-up. So I was blessed that Canadian Food Grains Bank gave us a little bit of money to have this man, Sid, with the white hair, who used to work in Burkina Faso, and his wife, who's in the picture also with kind of gray hair, to do three years in a row of follow-up, of teaching careful growing of amaranth and careful use of amaranth in the diet. So they trained a lot of the community health workers and they trained a lot of the, like the people that work with Peter, the agricultural teachers. Huh? And I think that's a mistake that we make a lot of time. We don't do a careful enough job especially with a new thing, like this grain. The people know, they know the leaf one, huh? They know the wild one. But we need to do a careful job of teaching about the cooking and the nutrition and the growing and the thinning and the threshing and all those things. So now I'll do my little advertisement about the video. Um, that video that somebody mentioned, the announcer mentioned for me, um, sorry, I forgot your name. It's Stan Like. Ah, got it. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so that video is a training video that you can now have for free, basically. Echo used to charge $5 for it, I think, or something like that. Okay, That's a video we made about 10 years ago that takes you step by step by step through the growing and the threshing by hand, though, of amaranth. And Peter is going to mention that the threshing is one of the labor-intensive things where we would benefit from a machine, some kind of appropriate technology. But okay. That's my little advertisement for the video. And there should be a second video in that package that's about Uganda and the people with their testimonies of how much it helps them in their nutrition. Okay, we can continue then. And then, okay, part of the teaching was how do you eat it? Uh, so you have here three, or well, two ways, actually, in the Mandazi and in the Uji. And it seemed to me in the evaluation we did that the uji for breakfast, the porridge, was the way that the children and the adults were consuming the most. Now, Peter may say that's not true, but that's what it seemed like to me. Um, the teaching we did was something like this. You take the grain and you can use it for uji for, I don't know what the middle one is again. Oh, chapati, yeah. And uh, mandazi is the next, or is that samosa? <laughs> anyway, okay, so there's lots of ways you can use it, also in Ugali. Next one, please. All right, so I'll give Peter a chance. Here's um, Peter to 
to explain about the number of farmers using it. Um, From here. Okay, let me give a bit of uh, history about uh, Western Kenya. Uh, Western Kenya was predominantly known for cotton growing, but uh, it collapsed because of poor management of the cooperative. It was being uh, supported by cooperative movement in Kenya, and it was uh, the only cash crop by that time. So when the cotton industry collapsed, the sugar cane came in. It was brought in by uh, 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 Bukatet from UK. That was in the early 70s. So people saw this is a hope for us to get cash crop. And they put all their pieces of land into sugar cane growing. But uh, the problems came upon. One of the biggest problems was that uh, uh, Kenya sugar industry could not compete with Comesa because the Comesa region is being subsidized. So farmers started getting uh, negatives out of, somebody has put uh, five acres, three to five acres in sugarcane at the end of the season, that is 18 months. You wait for 18 to 24 months before you harvest. And at the end of it, you are told, you owe the sugar factory some money. So why do you go home with your children, you have a family to feed? So that brought a lot of problem, problems. The issue, we started experiencing the issues of malnutrition. Children were eating sugar cane as lunch. Yes, that's what. Oh, that I wanted to, okay, when I reach there. I just wanted to summarize that, but it's in the slides. So children were eating sugar cane for lunch. And what does sugar has? To, the, to our bodies, you know that. Women were being now done, they, they, were, they became laborers on their own farm. Because women were the ones to weed and the men to pocket the money. And they disappeared to Mombasa to go and they swim in the ocean. <laughs> we started seeing the, the increase in the HIV AIDS prevalence. There was a, a school dropout, early pregnancies, gender-based violence. There was also a low production in terms of the soils have been exhausted because of use of heavy chemicals. So all these problems, when the amaranth came in, people saw, the farmers saw this another savior for us. Say hallelujah. <laughs> it, and indeed it was, because amaranth is food in itself. But later on, uh, through World Renew again, the team came in and started teaching farmers about how to use amaranth as a source of food, and especially the leaves. You know, amaranth was there, the indigenous amaranth was there, which was used as a vegetable. But this one came in, in addition, it was now, uh, it had a value of grain, grain amaranth. So it was said, this is how you utilize it, how you can mix with the other cereals. And in Western Kenya, the type of value chains we had, we had maize, a bit of beans, millet, sorghum, cassava, and uh, sweet potatoes. If you see those value chains, they are carbohydrates, fully carbohydrates. So if you combine sorghum, maize, uh, sweet potatoes, you are just eating one meal, one, one the, the value you are getting out of that is just carbohydrates, lack of proteins. So amaranth came in handy to, to, to give that uh, nutritional value of the proteins and the minerals. Uh, so what did we do? As somebody mentioned, we brought in the ministry, the government department to come and also pass the message right from the world level. We had uh, scows, uh, they are called, uh, those are agricultural extensions from the government. SCAO is sub-county agricultural officers, and WOW are the uh, uh, world agricultural officers. And home economics, they came in to start 
sensitizing farmers. So we worked in support. But what was also missing was, you know, the government does not support what it doesn't have in its plan. So we tried very much to champion so that they put it in their CIDP, County Integrated Development Plans. And right now, uh, Kenya has just started the developing a new nutritional strategic plan. The other one expired last year. And we have pushed it through the counties to make sure that the issue of nutrition and especially amaranth is incorporated. So that is one of the benefits that we can say we have accrued. Uh, let me just mention about the marketing, what we did with the marketing. We decided because already people had been brainwashed that they will get income from Amara. So we started doing a marketing, helping them to market through collection centers. When they come to the collection center, they bring in their, their, their produce. We also do lessons teaching. They were taught from there first. The first thing was to teach them about the utilization of amaranth before you do the marketing. And that is an approach that you have been using up to today, and it is very successful. Some of the challenges that the farmers are going through, one is drying the amaranth. If you don't dry it properly, then it is, uh, it, it, it is contaminated. It gets the moisture, is contaminated. Then it cannot be consumed as one of the challenge. So it needs proper drying. And you have also to dry on, a, on either a tampling, because if it gets contaminated with the soils, then definitely when it comes to eating, you not even enjoy it. The other issue is the harvesting, which he has just mentioned. That trying out the threshing machine, we got one, we tried, but it's still a challenge. Then uh, 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 the tools for popping. Well, you know, it's not like uh, popping the maize. It needs a dry, you don't put uh, any oil, it just has to be dry and you pop it. So the popping machine is also a challenge, it's nowhere in the market. Researchers have tried, but we haven't reached it there yet. And then the other problem is the storage, where to store, because it needs a lot of aeration and the dryness. So sometimes the farmers harvest and then they just put, lump it together. After a few months, because they're waiting to sell it, it gets down. Those are the challenges. Uh, lastly, the seed, the clean seed. Kenya seed, that is in Kenya. Kenya seed company has tried to come up with the amaranth seed, but when the farmers plant it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, what? It doesn't germinate. Yeah, I don't know why. We have tried it to complain, but no one has come up with it research on, on that. So that is the biggest challenge. And the, the ministry will always like, the Ministry of Agriculture will always say, we want to use the certified seeds. But it's not. So farmers have just continued using whatever they, they harvest. Yeah. So I, I think uh, the other thing I leave it, if there is any question, I'll be able to respond through, through the questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Peter. Um, Erwin, could you advance? All right, so here's, here we are. So, uh, so you have theory and you have practice, huh? And it goes back and forth. In theory, this amaranth, like I said, has so many characteristics that it should be just perfect for East Africa, huh? In theory, huh? And now you heard from Peter some of the actual living practice back and forth. And that was also interesting to me when we had the chance and the money to do a kind of in-depth evaluation. So we find out, out of 480 farmers that we interviewed in Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda, uh, we took the time to interview 480 farmers. 300 were continuing out of 480 who started. And the main reason they dropped out, if those 180 dropped out, was lack of market like he said, okay? Um, approximately half of those had been growing amaranth for between three and 10 years. And I was very interested to see if it was spreading farmer to farmer. And 80% said yes, they had taught someone else, which is good. Huh? 
66% consume the leaves and or the grain between two to seven days a week. I was interested in that question because you have to consume enough to make a difference, like I said about the uji. I think that's one of the key ways to get enough into people in a culturally appropriate way. Um, this one was interesting, the well-being. I don't know if they were telling us what they wanted us to hear, but people consistently said amaranth was the most important crop for their well-being, even though they were frustrated by the market aspect. Now that could use some more investigation. Huh? Um, but in, thanks to Peter's work in large measure, uh, and thanks to the millers in Nairobi, actually, who are open to introducing amaranth. It is now a cash crop in Kenya, but not so much yet in Uganda, as far as I know, nor in Tanzania as yet, as far as I know. Maybe it's catching on now. Okay, so now what do I do with this? Um, let's see. So, like I said before, it's well adopted. I think it's almost a perfect fit. Um, and the interesting thing is that it mixes so well with the traditional maize, sorghum, millet foods. And, as someone said, you can thin, when you thin it, you can eat the leaves from your amaranth grain crop. Huh? So the idea of eating the leaves is culturally appropriate too. But don't promise a market. Um, this one I need to talk with Brother Neil Miller a little bit. I think it can fit very well within the conservation agriculture as one of the rotation crops, okay? But from our experience with amaranth, I would differ from one of the presenters about the soil fertility, because we found out consistently the amaranth grew better close to the home sites, where the soil has more of the chicken manure, and maybe the children go pee pee there sometimes, and all those kind of things. So close to the home site, the amaranth grew better which means, very clearly, it needs better soil fertility, okay? So maybe you can grow it in the poor lands, but it won't give you a very good crop. Maybe it will give you something. So to me now, this is a reason for using a bottle cap of chemical fertilizer. Some people are against that, but just a little dose, a micro dose, helps it a lot in each planting spot. Um, and I would say a mistake that World Renew made when we were teaching is that we didn't teach the idea of legume cover crop or really we didn't, we didn't say to farmers, this is a high feeder. It's going to give you good food, but you have to feed it. So if you can figure out like a pigeon pea or lab lab rotation in your conservation agriculture thinking, that will help the amaranth as well as the maize. Um, and again, this is repeating myself, I think it's so important with a new crop to give good teaching and teach people, you know, what you do already with the leaves is good. That is going, and teach them why. That is going to give you calcium, vitamin A, etc. good things. But you know what? There's something new now. There's this grain one. Huh? And you can use that and that will help you because of the protein, and the high lysine that the maize doesn't have and the sorghum doesn't have, et cetera. So build, I would say, build from what people do and know, and then add, huh? Um, the seed is a problem, like Peter said. <clears throat> so this is where the agronomy people, the, the agriculture teachers can help. To select the seed heads in the field, the ones that have not crossed with the wild. When you see black seed in the amaranth, in the grain, you know it has crossed, okay? Um, so select your seed yourself if you cannot buy it from a reliable source. And then we who are development organizations, we need to work on this problem with the government too, of finding good quality fresh seed. <clears throat> so here is where Peter has already explained quite a lot, um, uh, especially the idea of collecting the seed at collecting points for the buyers. And here, uh, the idea that in, even at the village level, you can double the value if you can add value by processing it. Okay. 
this is one of the collection points in Western Kenya with the big sacks. Um, I would only add, Peter, I thought that that collection site was too hot. You know, they didn't have enough air circulating in there. Well, you said that too. That's important too. And if you get my, our presentation on the site, this one does not show up in the back, I know. But I thought I'd put that in there because it shows the, the nutritional content in the leaves. And way up at the top is the vitamin A one that really stands out. But some other ones for those who are nutritionists, you can compare what really is in the leaves. And then this one, the protein content, etc., of amaranth compared to these other staple foods in Africa. Um, and just a couple things. The, the protein um, varies from about 12% all the way to about 16. So that 14 figure is 14 grams per 100 grams. Huh? But another, some of the other ones, high in iron, high in zinc, which has a lot to do with the, the health of your lungs and the health of your intestines, um, high in calcium, and high in fat. Amaranth is about 7% fat. That's why you don't need to pop it in oil. It has its own oil inside the seed. That's why people get an energy boost. Okay. Um, the la we'll end with a story so you can ask some questions. This is a lady in Uganda saying, baby danced within me when I ate amaranth. Oh, the food will be late. All right, just very, very fast. For those who are interested a little bit in theory, uh, this relates to the previous presenter. Um, what, you know, amaranth is an, okay, let me say it this way. Child stunting is an integrative indicate, indicator. So many things, like she said, um, if the mother is not breastfeeding, all the time, and you get dirty water in the child's belly. So sick belly means child cannot digest food, maybe for two weeks, because that sick belly, that diarrhea, affects the intestine. Huh? So that's just a little example. Breastfeeding is for children very, very important. Huh? Um, the, the wash, the water sanitation, if you have dirty water, if you have poor sanitation, people get sick. If you have the mother or the young girls not properly nourished as adolescents, they are small, and then they tend to give low birth weight children. There's many, many more factors. But now, if we come to agriculture, which is mostly Ag ECHO and the Amaranth Institute, we come to what can agriculture do? Okay? We can't do everything. We can teach some of those other things. But what can we do? Well, here's seven things. We can help people grow it, in this case, grow amaranth for their own consumption. We can help them increase their income so they can buy more food. Uh, we can increase, help them increase their income so they can get better health care. Um, we can affect the prices of food, making food more abundant so it's easier to purchase. And then these last three, we can take into account gender dynamics, which I think Sabine is going to present a study a little bit on that. Um, if the amaranth takes too much of the women's time, for example, now we are hurting their ability to take care of their children. Okay? So we have to think about that, because it becomes a lot of work for women, the threshing especially. Um, if it increases the mother's workload, it's increasing the use of their energy. Kind of the same thing as the one before. And now somebody is going to talk about saving groups, I think. Uh, saving lending groups. So if we increase, say the woman makes some money from selling her amaranth. But if she has to give it over to the man, then she doesn't have control. So these are things that we can affect by the way we teach and the way we do in the villages. Huh? So I will stop now. Uh, that's a little bit of theory, especially from the Feed the Future people of USAID. Um, that helps us focus a little bit what we can do in agriculture to make our work more nutrition sensitive. Huh? Okay, thank you.
how could this, because the values for amaranth is, seems to be great in terms of uh, nutrition, addressing the issues of stunting. Now, how can it be, be promoted, I would say, enhanced and the government uh, gives it as, a, as one of the priority uh, produce to assist and to help the communities getting out of the challenges of, uh, of malnutrition and others by using the same uh, product. That is his question. But I'm trying to check on the seven key pathway between, I think it's agriculture and nutrition. Um, there in number five, six and seven, more emphasis is on women. Especialists talking of women's time, women's workload, women's control of income, etc. But the question I'm asking myself, who have power over women's time? Who have power over women's workload? Some of the issues are cultural and traditional related. So, is it not a right time also to include the other item there of intentional men engagement? Because if we change men mindset toward this, automatically, this could be so much easier to implement. Thank you. So, good afternoon. This is uh, Dr. Pavitra a lecturer at Nelson Mandela Institute, Arusha. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have a very basic question. Maybe others know, but I don't know. Uh, is a grain amaranth different from the leaf amaranth? What we, is it a new one or uh, a different uh, thing? And I am basically a seed technologist. Um, so I would like to know, is there any breeding program so far? The work presented was in Kenya, so I would like to know if anything is there in Tanzania. Any varieties that has been released and uh, about the seed quality aspect. You mentioned that the germination is poor. Um, can I know the actual germination percentage of that? And um, lastly, the source of the seed, and uh, you just mentioned the fat person, it is seven. So should we consider that as a good fat or, or it's a bad fat? Yeah, uh, sorry. Okay, let me end up here. <laughs> um. Thank you for the presentation. And my question comes to Tom now. Because we have attended the international conference in America several times and good connection with the Amaranth Institute. And we in Paradise, this, so we have started in 2004 with the Amaranth project. And now, since then, we have not changed our seats. And it's really a critical issue for me that we always continue with the same seats. And my question may be, it can also come to the government. Is it not possible to create a seed bank here, especially maybe in the university, so Koine, or somewhere, so that farmers can get fresh seeds? That's my question. The question about uh, what, what, do we, what do we need to do so, so that we increase the usability of the, the amaran? And I think that question was a bit also answered by the other presenter when she was talking about what the governments are trying to do to incorporate in their plans. And I said, if the government doesn't have it in their plans, they cannot implement it. We have the structures that we can use, like the East Africa Parliament. That's a structure that we can use to pursue the, our agenda through that, using uh, the, the MPs that, uh, that, that we have. We also have uh, a multi-sector approach uh, that was mentioned. That's where we bring in our agenda so that it is, it is taken up. Those are the avenues. There are still many more, but I feel those are, are, are strong avenues, that system, structures that we can use to bring the agenda of the Amaranth uh, on the platform, national platform. 
be integrated at the national level, then it is domesticated down at the, in the Kenya system, we talk about the, the counties and sub-counties. So I've tried to, to combine it to the, the, the two, the two questions. If it's not adequate, my, my colleague will add on. And then the issue of, of men engagement, I think that is, that's right, because we are talking about uh, uh, women, isn't women workload, who are the target? Who are, you know, there's a target group and then the, the beneficiaries. If we target the men, then the women will, will benefit. So I think that's just a strategy that we need to, to, to deploy and to bring in, bring in the issue of women. You see, like in Kenya, we have had so many things, Maendeleo Anawake, we don't have Maendeleo Anawame. <laughs> Uh, every project that comes out, they say it is focusing on it, women and development. Where are men? So those are the things that you are bringing in terms of advocating for also targeting women involvement directly. So thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Uh, maybe just to add one other thing that I have seen in southwestern Uganda with Pentecostal Assembly of God. They have their own radio promotion on Amaranth. And when I was there a few years ago, they asked me to speak on the radio station. So it, it can also be that the church gets very active in pushing it. And in that case, it was an area where many of the church members were getting AIDS. So when the church started teaching about Amaranth, people took it as good news from God, really, that this was something, an asset like in the devotion you gave, you know, the assets that God has put here for us that surprise us and amaze us sometimes. But that's the attitude that the church takes in that story about Amran. So it can be government, and we surely need government too. Um, so now the question Peter said I had to talk about. Um, the N Nelson Mandela Institute, is grain amaranth different from the other, from the leaf amaranth species? Yes, it is. The grain amaranths that, well, first the leaf. All over the world, there are leaf kinds. And if you want some of the best ones, a lot of those come from the, um, the Vegetable Institute in Taiwan. Okay? But th so there are the wild ones that are, people know already. And by the way, the wild ones that have the red leaves, that's a chemical in there called betalin, which is very good for you too. So red leaf and, and green leaf wild ones are good for you, the leaves. Uh, the seeds, though, are not very nice. They're usually tiny black seeds. Okay. okay, so about the leafy ones, that's the common local knowledge, but there are also improved leafy kinds. All right? Second thing now, the grain ones come from mainly two places, uh, Peru in the Andy Mount, Andes Mountains, but the kind that we have in East Africa mostly comes from Mexico, originally. And within those, there's two kinds, Hypochondriacus and Cruentus, and somebody said earlier they're usually, especially the Cruentus is usually kind of brownish color. Okay? But if you really want to identify, you have to ask this man who's in the Amaranth Institute, David Brenner, at Iowa State University, and you lay a seed head on a copy machine and take a picture and fax it or scan it to him. And he can tell what type exactly you have. But mainly to answer your question, the leaf kinds are different than the grain kinds. And the grain kinds mostly come from two places, Mexico and, and Peru. Huh? Well, what, now the other question, um, are there breeding programs in East Africa? Short answer is, I don't know, but the, it's called Kalro now in Kenya. What is the name of that again? Kenya Agricultural Livestock. Kalro is Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Organization. So sometimes they are selling seed. And that's the best source that I know up to now. Um, but short answer is, I don't think so. I think that this guy, Fitzson Wangi, during the 1970s and 80s, was selecting seed types. But it really needs for government and universities. This is a crop breeder task. Huh? 
And it's too bad that Matthew Blair from Tennessee State University could not be here because he is doing that kind of work in the state of Tennessee with the idea that maybe the weather is going to get hotter and hotter and we will have more amaranth growing in the United States. The other thing to say is that in India and in China, there's also a lot of work happening on amaranth. Okay? In Northwest India is the place where they're producing a lot for selling around in the world market. So I, I'm not so aware of that research in India and China. Um, what is the germination percentage? It is high if your seed is not too old and if it has not been stored in a very hot place. There's always two things with seed germination that Echo taught me, actually. The temperature and the humidity. So you keep the temperature fairly cool. That means you store it in a shade, shaded place. And you don't want the place to be damp inside or it will get moldy and black, like Peter said. Is the fat good or bad fat? Fat is good fat from everything I read, but I'm not a nutritionist, okay? But I read that it has this thing in called saponin. Maybe you know what that is better than I do. But it's supposed to be a good and fairly rare kind of fat or oil. Um, let me see. You had so many questions. Oh, <laughs> uh, Sabine has the same concern that I do about the seed, that we where most of us, even um, Zimbabwe, is using the seed from the same Davidson Mwangi, as far as I know. Uganda is using that seed. Kenya has been using that seed. Unless you have refreshed it from Calro. What the farmers are doing, you know, farmers are coming up with their own innovations based on the experiences they have had. They, they select a, a farm of maize in between. They isolate amaran. They put their seed bed. So they'll be selecting their seeds from there, so that it's not contaminated. That's something that uh, it just happened, and I was also amazed about it, because that was the farmer's own uh, innovativeness. Thank you. There was a question for you, right? Yeah, there is a question directed to the government, but uh, what I can say, my sector is not dealing much on the issues of seeds. I'm coming from Minister of Health. Uh, the sector which is dealing with the seed issues are Minister of Agriculture, Agriculture sector. Maybe I will advise to involve uh, people from agriculture because the role, the, the government is waiting for different uh, views and evidences and the research and so as to, to change policy. So the, your, your role is to create evidences and then after that just involve the government and the government will, will work on that. So I would suggest to maybe to involve Minister of Agriculture as well as uh, agriculture in, 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 in the agriculture sector we have uh, different institutions which are dealing with the production of seeds. Even here in Arusha, we have got Seriani. They are dealing with the, some researchers in the agriculture and the seed production and such kind of things. So it will be better if we involve them. Even universities like Sokoine University. Yeah. So the government is waiting for views, for uh, advices from you as stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah, so amaranth in the, in the area close to the equator, the seeds that, the types that we had from Davidson Wangi, which are basically two, the Cruentus and the Hypochondriacus, those two strains, both of which come from Mexico, okay, they mature in about 75 days. At first, though, he told me he had one that matured in only 45 days. But two and a half months is 75 days. But if you take that same seed and grow it farther away from the equator, it will take longer to mature. Okay? So this is also part of the art of it now, is to know your rainy seasons 
and in the crop rotation to plant it at the right time so that the soil is warm enough so that there's enough rain and I think there's the potential to get a crop rotation with the maize and sorghum and so on and millet because this amaranth could be planted potentially maybe when there's one month or six weeks left in the rainy season and still reach maturity after the rainy season ended, right? Especially as the days change, as the, even though they don't change very much here at the equator, the changing length of the days will cause it to flower and give seed. But you can more or less count on, if you're working in Tanzania, between 70 and 80 days length to maturity. My name is Buffalo Dinsekanabu. I work with Word Vision. I have, thank you for the very nice presentation. I have one question. I, I, I would like to know if there is a, a nutritional content difference between the amaranthus leaf and amaranthus glands. Thank you. All right, just so that we speed up, they've done good presentations, all of them, okay? So let's just get to the point, the question, all right? Okay, my name is Masarat Dawit. I am from Ethiopia, Haramaya University. Uh, I would like to thank for a brief uh, introduction about Amarat uh, seed. And I would like to ask one question. Do you have any plan or anything to promote to other African, East African countries like Ethiopia? Or is there any possibility to adapt this year to other regions because it looks like similar to our one of our grand staff. Is it possible to adapt this Amara to Ethiopia? Other we have also dry area, and is it possible or is there any room to work together? That's what I want to ask. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Kellner. I'm in Tanzania since 1983, and from the first day I know him Chicha. And uh, I did not know it before, and uh, at, at the end we called it spinach, right? It's not the same as spinach, it's clear. Um, and I've done fertilizer tests with different crops, onions and uh, maize, and don't ask me what, but also with Chicha. And the reaction of Nchicha on organic fertilizers was tremendous. So we, we really got uh, fantastic crops in terms of biomass. But then, those ladies which were harvesting for me, for weighing and comparing the crops and so on, we did this for three years, by the way, um, they were only harvesting the very, very nice tops and so on. Then uh, uh, I said, yeah, what's with the rest? So that's my question. Uh, what of how much of the, of the green plant uh, can be eaten and what is culturally accepted. Because if a leaf is bigger than this, here, this size, the ladies don't like, oh, no, 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 this can, cannot be eaten. So there's already a perception which I consider as completely wrong. That's, that's uh, uh, one thing, maybe you could clarify this. Uh, the other question is from the grain, uh, um, uh, uh, grain amaranth, um, of course, we can also eat the leaves, I assume. But to what extent does it, does it uh, contradict with harvesting grains at the end? But then I have another concern. Uh, the lady beside me from Ethiopia talks about TEF, and TEF has a huge problem in Ethiopia that is harvest losses. And the harvest loss has to do with the size of the grain. So now, now in, in normal ute bags, you cannot, you cannot store this. Uh, Traditionally, you have leather bags for this. So here, now to introduce leather bags is out of, no? then plastic bags, you know how much plastic is discriminated nowadays. So this is all not so easy uh, uh, to, to introduce this as, as a grain. So it remains a niche product, I guess. But maybe you can help if that is true, this assumption. Then in my garden, I have a huge garden, 2,800 square meter vegetable garden, amaranth, Omchicha is a weed. 
But of course we take it positive. But it hit us my, my, other, my other production. Because we always stand in front of it. Yeah, like you need this nice uh, um, teacher. Yeah, should we tr take it as a weed and take, pull it out? Or, or what do we want? We want the, the cucumbers and the tomatoes or we want the teacher? So um, it is not necessary to, uh, at least here, to introduce this in, in, in a large extent. It's there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the good presentation. Uh, it's my first time to be here in Arusha. I'm from Uganda, called uh, Rosmar Gretopeli. Uh, from the presentation, uh, it appears to me that uh, promoting Amarath is so ideal in as far as improving nutrition is concerned and also health. However, uh, I've been sitting here and posing questions to myself. Uh, there is a saying that too much of anything is bad. Now, when we promote this uh, Amara and people begin consuming it, like consuming maize or cassava on a daily basis, uh, what will happen? Will it not have any effect on the body? So, uh, please help me to understand. Suppose Amarath is taken a lot on a daily basis. What will happen? Help me to understand that. Thank you. About market, unfortunately, has gone out. But about marketing, the first market is with you. You consume meat. That is the market number one. Then it just spills over to your neighbor, the next door. In Kenya, we have what is called Nyumbakumi. I don't know in other places. <laughs> so you spread it with Nyumbakumi. That's the best market. Yeah. Uh, however, in terms of collaboration, I think that there is room for, for us to, to see how do we, like the neighboring countries, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, how do we also have our own Amarant society so that we can I think that I don't know how that will be picked. It can be part of the way forward so that we see how we engage yeah? the, the countries in this. And then the, that, that also includes the, 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 the Ethiopian. Some of the issues here, they have to go through the legislative systems. Eh? There are laws governing how, you, how, how do you transport a seed from one country to, to another. It may not be. I was in Ethiopia and I tried to carry Jera. I couldn't make it. I was told that one, it has to go through permission and all that. Even in Rwanda, we tried one time, it didn't work. So I think that needs, we will be guided by the, the, the team, the organizers here. How do we expand our relationships with what we are, we are doing? I think that will be the best, best way. Uh, too much of something, yes, even too much of maize is bad. The, 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 too much of sugar is bad. So we needed to, to follow up. We actually we need education. That's what it is. We need more education, even ourselves here. We can't be knowledgeable in everything. We need to, to be taught what is the right quantity for this. But I know what we have been learning in Amaran is say a ratio of one to three. One Amaran three others, whether it is sorghum, uh, maize, or finger millet. My colleagues will add on that. Thank you. So just on that one, when we are teaching uh, people a new crop about how to eat it, I think that's so, so important, that they taste it first, and then the rule of thumb that we used in that teaching um, where I showed you the man with the white hair and his wife teaching, huh? Was 40 grams a day per adult and 20 grams per day per child. But now, about a year or so ago, there was a, a scientific study in Kenya which used 100 grams a day. This was for people living with AIDS. They used 100 grams a day. So, Short answer is, I don't know how much, but I am pretty sure that amaranth should be seen as a nutrition supplement. Why? 
you cannot get enough carbohydrate, enough energy part, only because the amaranth is kind of hard to grow. It's labor intensive. Huh? It d doesn't give you a big ear like corn, you know, like maize. Okay? So it's always going to be a smaller quantity than maize, even smaller than millet or sorghum. So look at it like that three to one idea. Three parts of your maize or your millet or your sorghum or even your cassava and one part amaranth. Look at it as a supplement, something you add to, in, to make the whole thing richer and stronger. Would you agree with that, Peter? Okay. All right. um, okay, another question. Amaranth leaves, are the leaves better than the grain? Well, in a way, yes, because the leaves are easier. <laughs> what, how is the grain better? The grain is better because it has more protein for building your muscles and so on. Uh, and protein is, is one of the main reasons why we eat meat. Huh? So the grain is almost a perfect nutrition supplement for people who are vegetarians because they're poor, because they can't afford meat and eggs. Okay? But, okay, now, now take that into your mind. But remember that nutrients that come from animal sources like eggs, milk, meat, those nutrients are more easily absorbed by the human body. Okay? So, Keep it in mind that milk and eggs and meat are important for people. And if you are a vegetarian because you are poor and cannot afford those, then, then amaranth is almost the perfect nutrition supplement. I don't mean to insult anybody, you know, but there's different kind of vegetarians. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, so why is the grain? So grain is high protein, grain is high folic acid, um, grain is very high calcium, and the grain you can store easily if you dry it well. 